Hey everybody, Craig Cottle, Director of Nature Line School. In this lesson, which is lesson four, what we're going to be talking about are some very fundamental aspects of first aid and a first aid kit. Now, this is not going to change my recommendation to you that you get some first aid training. In the first lesson that we laid out to you, there's some fantastic resources there for you. That way you know where you can go and get really good first aid training. But what we do want to do is look at some of the fundamentals that we can share right here in this video and definitely look at the pieces and parts and all the things that would go into a first aid kit just for you. As far as some of the fundamentals are concerned, there's going to be three things that I want you to know by the end of this video. Number one, and that is always have safety in mind. You should have a plan for whatever it is that you're going to do. Number two, don't go into the woods or don't do things with idiots. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm being very serious. More often than not, when people get in bad situations, it's because they're doing things with idiots, people that make really bad decisions and stuff of that nature. And number three, that doesn't mean that you can't do adrenaline-fueled activities. Like if you want to go rappelling, that's fine. Just make sure you have a good rope, good carabiners, you tie off to the trees properly, you know how to rappel, you know the proper procedure. If you want to go down a class four rapid, that's fine. It's exciting, it's adrenaline-fueled, but wear a life jacket. Have a good paddle, have a good boat. All of these things that are exciting and adrenaline fueled, that doesn't mean that you can't do them. Just have plans to do them properly, have contingency plans to back yourself up, and then you can then go out, have fun, do it safely, and then come back so you can do it again. One of the first things I want you to know as it's related to first aid is if you come across somebody or somebody in your party lands in a position where they need first aid, you need to understand site safety first. And what I mean by that is you may just come across somebody and there they are and you don't know what caused them to fall, maybe break a leg, whatever's caused them to go unconscious. What if somebody is bit by a venomous snake? You rush into the scene to go help that person and then you too get bit by the same snake. Then we have a compounded problem with two people that are injured. So one of the first things you need to do when somebody's injured or they need that critical first aid is site safety. Make sure it's safe for you to enter. Now I'm gonna keep saying this because it's that important, but you need to get some first aid training, right? And this is just an introduction to that concept. But one of the things that's often taught in first aid is the ABCs of first aid. What we're gonna utilize this for today is to help us understand three important things. The first is awake. When you come upon a patient, that person may be or maybe not be awake. And if you go into that situation and you begin to shake them, you could cause more injury. So the first thing you do when you come into a situation where somebody may be unconscious, yell at them, talk to them loudly from a distance. Again, studying that site safety, and at the same time, trying to get them to come to a, a consciousness or wake them up so that you can communicate to them and find out what happened. B is for breathing, and again, CPR is a must-have skill here. This is not something I can share with you in this particular video. American Heart Association, American Red Cross, those are the places to go get some really good CPR training. And C, in this particular case for this video, is to continue care. One of the things that you should expect to be able to do is if you find somebody or somebody in your group needs first aid is to continue that care until someone who has more skill than you, an EMT, a paramedic, or a doctor, or somebody of that nature can help the person that is in need. Now, one of the things that comes up in regards to this is the ability to know if you can communicate wherever you're going. So if you're going to go hiking, you should know beforehand, does my cell phone work in that area? And if it doesn't, you should have a contingency plan how to get out if somebody gets injured. Now what I really want to dig into is the top three things that we see, particularly in a backcountry setting, a wilderness setting, maybe even on a playground that require first aid. The first one is a broken or sprained ankle. And the way we take care of that is we make it fat and sassy. What I mean by that is we need to find some material that we can wrap around the ankle to secure it somewhat, but still allow it to swell. That's the fat part. We can utilize a blanket. We can utilize a jacket, a sweatshirt. We can utilize anything that has the ability to allow that ankle to swell. We're then going to make it sassy. And what I mean by sassy is we get something that's rigid. 
You can use sticks from an environment like this. You can use the stays out of a pack. You can use a magazine even to wrap around a leg. The key here is that you want to have the fat on first and then the sassy so that it still allows it to swell and at the same time secures it. Once you get the sassy part, you secure it to the leg above and below the injury site. So if it's the ankle, you're going to secure it to the foot and somewhere up on the leg. That way, when it swells, it has that ability to swell. Again, you don't want to lose circulation to the toes. And as I've said numerous times, this is just a fundamental understanding. You need to get that first aid training. Hey, injury number two that happens quite often, and we're not going to demonstrate this one because it's nearly impossible without actually getting hurt, is that a lot of backpackers and hikers use the small backpacker stove similar to this one that you're seeing right here. Uh, typically they have a top on them. I've got the top off so you can see this, but the issue is that somebody puts water in a boiling system so they can put it in a backpacker meal and then they turn around they start putting up a tent or hanging their hammock or blowing up their sleeping pad and they forget that this is going. And when they turn back around it's shaking and it's wobbling and and then it falls on them. It, it spills over on them. They're trying to get everything turned off while water's coming out the top and people get burned. The other one, and this is really significant, is people have gotten in a habit, especially with systems like the one that you're seeing here, where they sit down with their legs crossed and they set this stove up right between their feet and their legs. And they sit there and they gain some heat off of it because it's cold outside or something like that. Then it boils over into their lap. And now you've got burns on your groin area or your inner legs. And that is a very significant problem in the backwoods. You're not gonna be able to walk out because it's gonna hurt too much. And burns are very significant issues. So again, Get a first aid course, study what you should do on burns, but prevent all that happening from the first place. Make sure you find a stable base like I have here where I found a stump. If I didn't have this, I might find a rock or a bare piece of ground where everything is really stable and then utilize my stove in a place like that instead of where it might shake and fall over. Hey, and the last thing we're gonna talk about are cuts. And here's the important thing to understand about any type of cut. It usually comes from utilizing a knife or an ax or something of that nature. So the best way to stop having problems with cuts is to not have a cut. So let's talk about some preventive measures with a knife. There's two parts of a knife that are really dangerous, the sharp side and the pointy side. You never want any point in time when you're using a knife or an ax or whatever it might be that could be sharp to be directed or pointed towards your body. It's real easy to do something like this. You have something in your hand, you wanna carve it and you point your knife like this. You should never do that. If you wanna drill a hole with the end of a knife, then put the piece of wood down on the ground, okay? If you're gonna cut and you're gonna whittle, you don't wanna sit down and whittle towards your legs. You wanna be whittling in such a way that you're whittling away from your body. Now beyond that, if you do find out or if something happens that you have a cut, something happens, then here's the procedure for fundamental cut maintenance. The first thing you wanna do is put pressure near the wound site between the heart and the wound. So let's use, for example, my hand. Let's say I cut my hand right here. I wanna put pressure on my arm just above the wound site. What that's gonna do is help decrease the amount of blood flow that's going to that site. Secondly, what I wanna do is I can cleanse that wound as best I can. Any water that you feel comfortable drinking, like from a water bottle or something of that nature, you can spray it into or pour it into a wound site to get any debris that's in there out of the wound site. And again, next, what you wanna do is cover it up. Covering it up means use some gauze, some four before gauze, rolled gauze or something of that nature. And when you get everything secure with some medical tape or something of that nature, then place it above your heart. In this particular case, it's my hand, but if it was my leg, I may lay down and then place whatever portion of the body is cut above the heart level. So if I've got a cut on my leg, I would lay down, elevate my feet on a log, on a pack or something of that nature. And what that does is it helps again, decrease some of the blood flow going to that injury. And I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm gonna to continue to say this. American Red Cross or American Heart Association, National Security Council, those are all good choices to get solid, in-depth first aid training but this will at least introduce the topic to you. So get into one of those classes whenever you can. Now, what we wanna discuss is first aid kits. As you can tell, there's all kinds of different shapes and sizes that I have here to show you. One of the first things we wanna talk about having in a kit are medical gloves. Gloves are gonna be invaluable to taking care of a patient properly so that you don't get any debris 
or even bacteria that's on your own hands into a wound site of somebody else. So it's very good and very important that you have medical gloves as far as your first aid kit. Now let's take a look at some of these other things that I have here. Number one, I'm a big fan of four, what's called four before gauze. That's four inches by four inches. This is it unpackaged. This is what it looks like in the package. I'll usually have five or six of these in my first aid kit. And these are great to cover up wound sites. These are great to soak up blood. These are useful in a lot of different first aid situations. Secondly, for large wounds, I like having rolled gauze. Rolled gauze can roll out and you can use it to tie up wound sites. You can take this and just stick it into a large wound site to soak up blood. So this is a fantastic piece of equipment to have in your first aid kit. Triangular bandages are called triangular bandages because when you fold them out, they look like a triangle, right? But these are great for securing an arm to your body so it doesn't move around if your shoulder is broken, dislocated, or you have a broken arm. Several different uses for these. Again, all this is stuff that you should get out of American Heart or uh, American Red Cross coursework. Tape. There's a couple of different types of tape that I like to keep in my first aid kit. One is sports tape because it's very strong and handle a lot of pressure. And then I also like having flexible tape. And what this is good for is those injuries like we talked about earlier where you might have an ankle injury and you need it to swell. Tape like this does not have any give to it once you put it on a wound site, but this does. And so because it has all that flex to it, it's a good item to have for an area that might be swelling. I have a syringe in my first aid kit and it has one purpose really and that is to help clean out wound sites. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll pull water into a syringe like this and then spray that into a wound site so that it helps get any debris that might be in a cut or something of that nature. SAM splint is a really useful piece of equipment that is flexible but at the same time it holds it on its own shape. So if you have a broken arm or something of that nature then what you can do is really rather quickly form this so that you can use it to help support a broken limb or a dislocated limb or something of that nature. Earlier, we used a sweatshirt around my ankle, but we could easily just pull this apart and wrap this around my ankle and it would have provided both the fat and the sassy. Earlier, I made a recommendation for you to get into a course like Stop the Bleed or something like that so that you can be able to take care of traumatic injuries and things of that nature. That's what tourniquets and hemostatic agent is utilized for. So this is not necessary for your basic fundamental first aid kit, but for anybody that wants to know trauma medicine and gets the training, then these are invaluable tools and I highly recommend you get both that training and these supplies for your first aid items. Now the last item I want to talk about that's real fundamental is if you have somebody in your family or your group that requires special medicine, then I highly recommend you have an extra medicine that you are legally allowed to have in your first aid kit. For example, I have diabetic supplies because I have somebody in my family that's a diabetic that I can keep in my first aid kit. That might include something like an EpiPen or something of that nature if you have somebody that's allergic to stings. But at the very least, always remember the people that have special medical conditions and make sure you have those supplies in your kit as well. Hey, I would call that a quick and dirty look at first aid and a first aid kit meaning you really need to. If you haven't noticed, I've said this a few times, you really need to get some really solid first aid training. So jump into that American Heart Association, American Red Cross, National Security Council, or whatever is offered in the area in which you live. It's fantastic training, it'll be good for you. Come on, join in, let's learn together.